Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our GI knowledge sessions. These are a series of talks and seminars about gemology that are fueled by our decades of research. And at GIA, we're so lucky to be able to study and learn from gems every day. And that's our mission to share it with the world. So I'm really excited to kick things off today. I'm Kelly Giordano, a member of the content team here at GIA, and I am joined by Chun Wei Zhao, a member of or a manager of the identification for pearls. And he'll be speaking today about the techniques and challenges that come with pearl identification. So before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. Everyone is automatically muted. So if you have a question, please submit it using the Q&A feature you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end where Chunwi will have the opportunity to answer some of your questions. We'll also be sending a recording of the session to you uh, either later today or early tomorrow morning. Uh, and that will also have a survey. So we would love to hear your feedback as well. And so with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Chunwi. Thanks. Hi everyone, thank you Kelly and thank you everyone for joining. All right, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about pearl identification with you all, uh, which is an important part of gemstone testing in a gem lab. Uh, pearl identification requires a number of different gemological and advanced instrumentation techniques. Some of these techniques are really unique uh, to pearls only. Uh, they are not really used for testing on any other gemstones. So today I'd like to give you an overview on these techniques, uh, both in terms of the routinely used conventional techniques in the lab, as well as so-called unconventional techniques, which are some of the methods we have experimented with and they have the potential to solve some challenging issues involved with pearl testing. So by the end of today's talk, I hope everyone will have a pretty good idea on how pearls are being tested in a gem lab setting, especially in GIA. So first of all, there are many different types of pearls, as you can see from this group of beautiful images. Uh, these images were taken uh, by GIA staff over the past many years, so people can divide or separate pearls in different ways. Uh, the most important way of separation is natural pearls versus cultured pearls. Uh, sometimes you may hear people saying, this is a saltwater pearl, and this is a freshwater pearl. But more frequently, you will describe pearls using their common name or mollusk species type name. For example, these are a group of conch pearls. This is a mellow mellow pearl. This is a pearl from Northern Quaho clan. Spondylus pearls, pen pearls, scallop pearl, uh, natural pearls from Tintada species, Tridexna clan pearl, abloni pearls. Here you see a group of images. Uh, here you see a group of pearls. Uh, these are cultured pearls. People usually just describe them as Akoya, South Sea, or Tahitian pearls, or freshwater cultured pearls. So what I have just describing to you are uh, all the important identification uh, information a lab needs to provide uh, when we receive pearls uh, from the client. So if you look at our GIA pearl identification report, uh, we provide a lot of uh, information and the details about the item we receive in the lab but the most important part is in this box area containing four key identification uh, information, whether the pearl is a cultural pearl or a natural pearl, uh, whether the pearl came from a saltwater environment or freshwater environment, what type of mollusk it is, uh, and what type of pearl it is basically. So here you see Pintada maxima, which is the name, a uh, species name, for South Sea pearls. Uh, last but not the least, we also provide information about the treatment, whether the pearl has been treated in any way. And this is also a very important part of pearl testing. So today, all the techniques I'm going to describe today uh, were related to these four key 
key identification information fields. So these techniques provide at least one or more type of information, and it's like a puzzle. Uh, only when we have all the piece of, piece of information, we can put everything together, produce this final report to you. Sometimes uh, more than one technique can provide the same type of information. That's great. We can use uh, different techniques to uh, reconfirm and double check our results. All right. So before I jump into the modern day pearl testing techniques, I do want to take a back look at the history, uh, how pearls are being tested in the earlier days. When I say earlier days, uh, I mean the beginning of the 20th century uh, after Mikimoto introduced a Koya cultured pearl into the market. Because before that, virtually all pearls were natural pearls. Maybe there was some, a little bit of cultured pearls, uh, some imitations, but the number uh, was quite insig uh, insignificant. Mikimoto introduced a large amount of Akoya cultured pearls into the market. It virtually changed the, the, the landscape of the pearl industry. So people realized that we really had to find ways to, to separate natural pearls and cultured pearls. So as early as in 1930s, uh, we saw articles being published describing different methods of testing pearls, uh, such as in this article from Robert Shipley Jr. from GIA, in gems and gemology around 1930s, he tried different methods of pearl testing. And he found out that the best way to separate cultured pearls, and back then, uh, the focus was to separate bead cultured pearls from natural pearls. So the best way to separate uh, bead cultured pearls uh, was to use something called endoscope. Endoscope means uh, you insert a thin needle with lighting into the drill hole of the pearl and by looking at the pattern coming out from the drill hole, the pattern of the light, uh, you can tell whether it's a cultured pearl, bead cultured pearl, or natural pearl. If the pearl did not have a drill hole, you can use something called candling or blinking, which we can still use nowadays, but we know that it's not a reliable way of testing pearls. Um, he also tried something called UV fluorescence, but unfortunately it was not very helpful to separate cultured pearls from natural pearls back then. Now we know that UV fluorescence could be important uh, for other purposes. Uh, I will be talking more details about these uh, in, the, in, in shortly after. So around 1940s, uh, we have uh, Robert Shepley Jr. also designed a very interesting uh, instrument called a perloscope. It combines three things in one. Uh, a microscope, an endoscope, and also candling function. So uh, this unit uh, was sold to many jewelers across the nation and helped them uh, separating many bead cultured pearls from natural pearls. Uh, I think I checked with GI library and uh, fun fact, uh, it was sold for $147 back in 1940. All right. So also around 1940s, uh, scientists started to use different type of x-ray techniques for pearl testing. Uh, some of the techniques are shown here, film x-ray radiography, x-ray fluorescence reaction observation, and x-ray diffraction. And the first two methods continue to be an important part of modern day pearl testing. Uh, I will be talking more in details later uh, and we, of course, we use uh, better equipment nowadays, uh, but the underlying fundamental uh, theory is still the same. Uh, nowadays, we don't use X-ray diffraction anymore. Um, back then, people think that they can separate natural pearls and bead cultured pearls using X-ray diffraction because the diffraction pattern, uh, pattern on the surface of these pearls are different. However, if you have a small bead, thick nacre, bead culture the pearl, uh, the diffraction pattern will be the same as a natural pearl. So it's not a good reliable way to test pearls either. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we use better equipment nowadays. So nowadays we don't use films anymore. Uh, in the earlier days, we use film x-ray. So we keep a lot of films. This is part of GIA's pearl testing history. 
So we still keep them uh, as a record, but everything is computerized, digitalized, uh, data saved in uh, computers nowadays. Now here you see a group of techniques. This is a modern day pearl testing setting in the lab. And we use a variety of ways for testing pearls. Uh, most of these images were taken uh, in our Bangkok lab, uh, but we also have the capacity of processing pearls uh, in multiple locations uh, around the world, uh, in Hong Kong, in New York, and to some degree in Carlsberg lab as well. So I'm going to describe uh, each one of them uh, in more details one by one, but here is uh, uh, the summary of them. Uh, starting from the most basic epistemological test, like a microscope observation, to long wave UV fluorescence reaction, short wave UV fluorescence using a diamond view unit, X ray radiography, uh, computerized tomography or CT, X ray uh, fluorescence observation, EDXIF uh, chemical analysis. UV based refractance spectroscopy and the Raman and the Raman photoluminescence. So let's first take a look at surface observation, which is the simple gemological tool. Every, every time we receive pearls in the lab, the first thing we do is to look at the pearls. What can we do? What can we tell uh, by looking at the pearls? Well, we can see a lot of things to uh, experience the gemologist. So pearls can be nacreous or non-nacreous on the surface. Nacreous pearls usually show something like this on the left, overlapping nacre platelet structures or this sort of swirly spiral kind of structure. Surface can be also uh, depending on the species and also depending on uh, how pearls are being processed uh, after harvest. It could be polished, it could be heavily polished, or worked. So these can also alter the surface uh, condition and surface features. For non nacreous pearls, uh, they may have characteristic uh, surface features like flame structure in this conch pearl. Some other type, mellow mellow, uh, scallop, uh, tridacna, horse conch, they also have their own unique flame structure. This one here on the, on the bottom, uh, this is a abalone pearl uh, with a bumpy bubbly surface and also very characteristic greenish uh, iridescence. So sometimes we uh, look at the pearl, we can instantly know what type of pearl it is to an experienced gemologist. Of course, we're going to check other data and also collect the other data from other techniques but surface observation is a very important starting point, part of the pearl identification. Sometimes you see something very strange, not very uh, close to the pearl surface. This is also a natural indentation. You may know that this is probably not a pearl. It may be an imitation, or it could be a coated pearl with coating on the surface. So the surface is not a natural pearl surface. Sometimes you see color concentration deposits in the blemish or around the drill hole of the pearls. These are instant um, indication that these pearls might be color treated. The color is not natural. Okay, they are dyed pearls. If the pearl has a drill hole, you can also look down into the drill hole and, and see whether you can see a bead nucleus outline. If you see that, maybe you know that it's a bead cultured pearl. Surface can be worn or coated, or can also can be uh, worked, as I mentioned earlier. So this is a worked surface. People try to smooth the surface away in one area. It could be due to the fact that it was slightly attached to the shell, or maybe it was a blemish that people want to remove, or maybe it was uh, intended to set on a piece of jewelry. From a research point of view, we can also observe a surface using more advanced instruments like a scanning electron microscope. 
So these are two SEM images of the pearls. Under high magnification, you can see the naked platelet structures as well as the fine uh, pseudo-hexagonal kind of tablets being arranged on these structures. You wouldn't be able to see these using a microscope. Now the second technique uh, we can use on pearls, also very simple, is UV fluorescence observation. Uh, we can put pearls under either long wave UV or short wave UV, and using diamond view is better in our, in our opinion. So under long wave UV, pearls may exhibit uh, their normal fluorescence depending on their species, also depending on uh, the body color of the pearl. Usually the darker the color is, the weaker the reaction is. The lighter the color is, the stronger the reaction is. Certain species like these three pearls in the bottom here left, um, showing very distinct reddish fluorescence and the long wave UV. And we know that these pearls are likely from Pateria species, Pateria sterna, Pateria penguin, all right? If you have a pearl that's been color treated or bleached or dyed, you may see some uh, uh, different fluorescence under the long wave UV comparing to a normal untreated pearl. So we can get a feeling, um, even though it's not 100% sure, but we can get a quick idea whether pearls might be color treated. Short wave UV and the diamond view um, also give us, gives us similar information, but their reaction are different. Most of the pearls, as far as we know, uh, produce bluish fluorescence under short wave UV in diamond view. The color treated pearls tend to show weak or inert reaction. So both methods can be used for color detection as well as uh, detecting certain species, in, especially for long wave UV, this pateria species. Now, more recently, I want to um, show you this interesting slide here. More recently, uh, we, are, uh, we are trying to, to use a better, uh, more advanced instrument to measure the fluorescence reaction of the pearl. So this is related to uh, UV fluorescence observation, but instead of looking at the fluorescence, we are measuring the fluorescence using a spectrometer designed by our instrument group. Um, and we found out that this uh, spectroscopy can give you more accurate, measurable, consistent data, and maybe even wider range of detection than human eyes. I'm showing you two examples here. Both examples are going to be uh, published in more detail in the future on our GNG journal. On the left, uh, we are using a long wave UV excitation source and the measuring pearls that have been treated with optical brightness. If you haven't heard about optical brightness, this is a, so, uh, a set of chemicals that are applied to some freshwater cultured pearls, as well as some maybe a koya pearls to make the pearl look whiter or brighter. This is um, different than bleaching. Bleaching can be, bleaching is the removal of the color uh, from the surface, but optical brightener is to adding a layer of chemical to make it look wider. It's like an optical illusion. So we can easily detect treated optically brightened pearls from unbrightened pearls using uh, UV fluorescent spectroscopy. All right, the brightened pearl showing a very distinct 432 nanometer uh, fluorescence peak while uh, the untreated pearls showing you um, 486 nanometer uh, uh, fluorescence peak. And under the long wave UV box, you can also see the treated one showing a more bluish fluorescence uh, agree with uh, this spectrum. On the right here, we are seeing two groups of pearls. This one on the left are all treated color, including freshwater, saltwater, South Sea Tahitian. On the right, all natural color, okay, also including freshwater pearls, 
South Sea and Tahitian using a shortwave UV excitation source. All the naturally colored pearl showing a strong, relatively strong fluorescence at around four, uh, 340 nanometer, while all the treated pearls showing very weak to inert reaction. We think this is probably due to the protein fluorescence from the pearls, the concoilings within the pearl. Treated pearls uh, usually damage or mask the concoiling fluorescence so that their reaction is always low. So we are very happy to show you these uh, very interesting techniques today. And hopefully this technique can be used as a routine process uh, for pearl testing in a regular lab setting. Now the next technique is X-ray microradiography, which is uh, the most important technique for pearl testing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it started from the earlier days. And here you see a very old unit from 1950s from GIA. It's very bulky. And it produces films like the one in the middle. This is a film X-ray image. The pearls inside of the film are typical non-bead cultured pearls from Lake Biwa, Japan during 1960s. Nowadays, everything is computerized, digitalized. So we produce image like this on the bottom, a typical bead cultured pearls with a round bead nucleus or natural concentric growth structure. So these three different type of uh, uh, structures are the major three type of pearls in this world. Bead culture the pearl, non bead culture the pearl, and natural pearl. Uh, these are very uh, straightforward examples, uh, but in reality, uh, the, there are many different type of structures, natural structures, and the, to some degree, non bead culture the pearl structures. So there might be challenges uh, related to this but I will be talking a little bit in more details later. So what happens if a pearl has a borderline structure or some very interesting structure? We can use something called X-ray computed microtomography, which gives better, more detail of the internal structure of the pearl. And I'm showing you a very interesting example here. This is a pearl featured in an early article published by GIA, led by Ken Scarrett. And we actually use a small gastropod shell to culture the pearl. So there's a shell inside of this pearl. It's the atypical uh, bead culture the pearl. Here you see a 2D uh, CT slide view. And we can collect many of these slices. And we can, we can select the internal structure and then reconstruct it into a three-dimensional model. So here you see what's exactly inside of the pearl. It's a beautiful gastropod shell. Without the need to cut the shell, uh, cut the pearl open, you can see what's exactly inside of the pearl in three-dimensional. So this is uh, an, ad an advantage of the CT data. So we have a similar example here. A freshwater cultured pearl looks like a flower. If we cut it, we see there's a thin, thin piece of flower-shaped shell and one half dome shell glued together. So this is what's inside of the pearl. Without cutting the pearl, we can use CT data to make a, a short movie and viewing the entire structure in 360 degrees. So here we go. All right. So the transparent part are the naked part. And then we have the flower shaped thin piece of shell and also a half dome. So CT data gives us better visualization of the internal structure of the pearl, which proved to be very important in modern day protesting. 
The next technique is called X-ray fluorescence reaction. Again, it's an old technique starting from the earlier days. But nowadays we have a better equipment, camera capturing the fluorescence. The theory behind this is uh, pearls and shells from freshwater environment uh, can fluoresce under the X-ray excitation, while pearls and shells from saltwater environment usually do not fluoresce under the X-ray excitation. This is due to their different manganese concentration in the water. Manganese is responsible for the fluorescence reaction. So here you see a freshwater pearl showing strong reaction under the X-ray. How about a pearl, a saltwater pearl, containing a freshwater shell bead? Well, in this case, it will also fluoresce, but it could be weaker depending on the naked thickness. So you see uh, the reaction is weak, but inside of the pearl, there's a drill hole. You can see it's strong inside. So you know the fluorescence is coming from inside, not the naked part. The beauty of this technique is you can scan a multiple number of pearls and quickly know how many pearls fluoresce. And then you know that there are some pearls we need to pay more attention to. In this strand, we see a, a few pearls fluoresce. So these pearls are either freshwater pearls or saltwater bead cultured pearls. So we know that very quickly. We can use other techniques to confirm whether they are freshwater or saltwater. How do we do that? We use energy dispersed X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. This is a chemical analysis uh, method and we usually focus on two types of um, elements, manganese and strontium. As I mentioned earlier, there are more manganese in freshwater environment, very little or none manganese in saltwater environment. On the other hand, we have more strontium uh, in saltwater environment, but less strontium in freshwater environment. So the ratio between these two uh, numbers can be a very good indicator whether the pearl is come from a saltwater or freshwater environment. There are other uses for this method. If there is an imitation or a coated pearl, you put it in this machine, you will see a completely different chemical uh, fingerprint than a regular normal pearl. Some pearls uh, will be treated uh, with silver nitrate. Then you will detect a large amount of silver on the surface of the pearl. And th in this way, you will know that the pearl has been treated. Silver nitrate is usually used uh, for dyeing, for making the pearl look darker. Now next, uv vis reflectance spectroscopy. This is a method to scan through uh, from UV to visible region on colored pearls and to determine whether their color is natural or treated, or maybe uh, to certain uh, pearls, we can tell what kind of species it is. So there are two major applications for this technique. One is for golden color South Sea cultured pearls, and the other one is for Tahitian pearls. Here is the first example. Um, starting from uh, 1990s, uh, the golden color South Sea culture of the pearl gained a lot of popularity in the market and their values also increased a lot. So people try to treat pearls into golden color using different ways. Under UV vis reflectance spectroscopy, normal golden color pearl showing very typical two absorption peak at 365 and 430 nanometer. A treated pearl may show something entirely different, like this one at 410. But different treatments can give you different uh, patterns, but they are usually different from the naturally colored pearls. In GIA, we have done a lot of research on this, so we published a lot of articles uh, regarding to the color detection of golden pearls. 
This is the second example for UV vis refractance spectroscopy. Tahitian pearls usually give a very unique 700 nanometer absorption peak uh, under the reflectance spectroscopy. This is probably due to their unique pigmentations inside of their pearls. Sometimes you also see 405, 495 peaks as well. But sometimes Tahitian pearls can also be treated like the one here. These are treated pistachio color pearls from the dark gray Tahitian pearls. So the treated pearls still show 700 nanometer peak, but the pattern in the lower wavelength is very different than a normal Tahitian pearl. So we can use this method to determine Tahitian treated pearl as well. Finally, uh, we have this Raman and the Raman photoluminescence. Raman spectroscopy can tell us the mineral composition of the pearls, usually uh, in the form of aragonite or calcite. But to some pearls, some colored pearls, especially the pink, purple, and orange freshwater pearls, or the non-nacreous pink conch pearls, metal metal pearl, horse conch, scallop, all these pearls contain unique pigmentations that can be shown on Raman spectroscopy. These two peaks are typical, the peaks around 1100 something and 1500 something, the exact number uh, will be slightly different depending on their chemical structures. But these two peaks, if we see them, we know it's a natural pigmentation, all right? These large peaks here and the smaller peaks are from aragonite. Photoluminescence, on the other hand, give us a, a different type of information. Here is an example, we have four pearls a Pteria sterna, Pteria penguin, Pintada margaritifera, and a Pintada madalenica. The Pteria pearls tend to have a very characteristic, distinct triple peak pattern under the luminescence, uh, under 514 nanometer laser excitation, showing this type of luminescence around 620, 650, and 680 nanometer. The Pintada species usually do not show obvious peak pattern. And uh, this is one way we can separate Pintada species from Pteria species. There's another uh, application for photoluminescence is to detect golden pearl treatment. I didn't show the uh, picture here, but you can read our articles. Uh, so basically a treated golden pearl usually show a very high luminescence feature and the Raman photoluminescence. So what I have been describing to you are all the routine uh, methods that we use in the lab for pearl testing. And with these existing techniques, we can confidently identify the majority of the pearls in the market. However, there are still some challenges with pearl testing especially separating some natural pearls versus non bee culture pearls because their internal structure could be borderline, very similar. Sometimes mollusk species identification is also challenging. Uh, treatment ch uh, detection uh, could be challenging, but we are confident uh, with existing techniques, we can detect uh, the vast majority of the treatment uh, and also in the, in the industry, people trying to develop new treatment all the time. So we need to uh, keep an alert uh, on these type of pearls. Probably the easiest part is to separate saltwater versus freshwater pearls. But even with that, there might be some challenges. There is an article published last year by our Bangkok lab led by Nick Sturman. So we have three interesting pearls showing both saltwater and the freshwater environment chemical uh, fingerprints. So it, we still don't know whether it's, uh, they are from saltwater or freshwater, but these are very rare cases. Most of the time, 
uh, separating salt water and the fresh water pearls are pretty straightforward. So now for the next section, I'm going to describe a few methods we have experimented with, and it's called so-called unconventional methods, and they may be able to uh, solve some of these challenges I just mentioned. The first unconventional technique I'm going to talk about is called radiocarbon dating. You might have heard about it in some other articles. So basically, we are looking at the carbon-14 content in a pearl and estimate the relative age of the pearl. There are two advantages of this method. It can provide or support uh, the provenance for some historical important pieces. So here we published uh, an article a few years ago in collaboration with the University of Arizona in the Goblin Lab. Um, there are a group of pearls reportedly from Venezuela uh, during the Columbian era. So it's, they are very old pearls. So we checked carbon dating and uh, we confirmed that these pearls were about 500 years old, which were sometime between pre to early Columbian era. So carbon dating can really support the historical provenance of certain pearls. The second uh, advantage of this method is to support uh, whether the pearl could be a natural pearl or a cultured pearl, support the identification of the pearl. For example, you have a pearl containing borderline, difficult to analyze, internal structure. And the pearl looks a little bit old to you. What you can do is you can do carbon dating. And if the pearl proved to be a relatively old pearl, a hundred year old, or maybe pre-atomic era, then you know that there's a, a more chance this pearl is a natural pearl. If a pearl came back as a new pearl, uh, we still don't know for sure because it can still be a natural or cultured pearl but at least radiocarbon dating may provide support on certain cases. The second unconventional technique we experimented with is called DNA barcoding. You probably also heard about it in some other articles as well. So in GIA, uh, we tested uh, in Japan, uh, this is an article published a few years ago, uh, led by Kasuko in our Japan lab, uh, we tried to test DNA from a Koya culture, the pearls, and to prove that it's possible to extract DNA from pearls and confirm they are Pintada Fukada. We also did a bunch of tests on freshwater pearls. Uh, so there are a number of pearls from American freshwater pearls and Chinese freshwater pearls. We send them, without telling which one is which, uh, we send them to University of Guelph, uh, the Center for Biodiversity in Canada. And uh, the results came back pretty promising. By the way, I should say that not all pearls contain enough DNA, or not enough DNA can be extracted in every pearl. So some pearl came back with no results. But for the ones that we can get the results, the, the answer is always accurate and matched with our expectation. For example, the, the American freshwater pearls came back as a uh, pink heel split, uh, splitter or washboard mussels. They are all common uh, freshwater pearl mussels from American water. The Chinese freshwater pearls came back as Hyriopsis cumingi or Hyriopsis shilangi. So the, these are the type of mussels used for a uh, culturing uh, farm in China. So we think DNA barcoding could be a potential uh, method, not only for species determination, but also can help with identification of pearls. If the pearl is from American freshwater uh, mussel, then it's more likely to be a natural pearl. If a pearl is from a Chinese freshwater mussel, it's more likely to be a cultured pearl. All right. The next 
technique is called index chemical analysis. This is similar to uh, gemstone origin kind of determination. So we use more advanced instrumentations like LAICPMS and also advanced uh, statistical analysis uh, to detect different trace elements in pearls and in a hope to separate pearls from different water environments or geographic uh, origins. And we tried with freshwater pearls first in American freshwater and Chinese freshwater. This is an article published uh, last year led by uh, Bai from our Cowsbed lab. And uh, we can, uh, the results show that there is a possibility to separate most of the pearls, American freshwater and Chinese freshwater pearls using this technique. Although some pearl may have overlapping uh, trace elemental concentrations. In order to make this method better, uh, we also need uh, more known data from known samples. So we collect additional data uh, from a group of American freshwater pearls from Mississippi River. This group uh, were borrowed from carry pearls. So we are hoping in the future that this method can further help and support our identification of pearls. Now, finally, this is something, technically speaking, is not a pearl testing method yet. But I do want to show it here because it's very interesting and very, very useful information, uh, oxygen isotope analysis on pearls. Oxygen isotopes, oxygen 18 to 16 ratio, can be related to the water environment and also the temperature during the growth. And we confirm this by checking this freshwater uh, non bee culture the pearl. We cut it um, apart and then measure the delta O18 value across uh, the growth. We see a very nice cyclic pattern on delta O18 values. And this is related to the temperature during the growth from winter to summer to winter to summer again. This is the low delta O18 value indicating a warmer temperature. So there are two summers passed for this pearl. Okay, on, on direction B, there's only one summer because we only checked half of the uh, section because the other half is concluding. So this is the middle line, which is the starting point of the growth. Uh, we did this academic research using very advanced instrument called SYNC secondary ion mass spectrometer in University of Wisconsin Medicine. And we reported this result in 2018 GSA meeting. So not only pearls can be used for maybe for paleoclimate study because the delta O18 value is very consistent with uh, the temperature pattern. But we are hoping that one day maybe oxygen isotope analysis can be used uh, for pearl identification as well. Maybe we collect powder on the surface. Maybe they are related to the growth environment, different regions. Uh, these are all under research and we are hoping one day this could be uh, a very interesting unconventional technique. So this basically concludes uh, all the techniques I'm, going, uh, I'm planning to talk about today. Uh, we did not have a time to talk about something called pearl classification. This is an entirely different uh, uh, story, and, but it's also an important part of pearl testing. Pearl classification is uh, to evaluating uh, the quality of the pearls. It's like diamond grading, pearl grading. So in GIA, we have a set of uh, system to classify pearls using the seven value factors, shape, color, size, nature, luster, surface, and the matching. So this is all a very important part of pearl testing, but it's not in the scope of today's talk. So that being said, I think it's the end of this talk and I'm happy to take any questions from you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think this has been a lot of great information and we got a lot of great questions. So 
let's jump right in. Um, how long will the nucleus, how large will the nucleus be that is inserted into the mollusk? And how thick would the nacre, how, how thick is nacre on average with a cultured pearl? Okay, it depends on the type of pearls. A koya pearls, of course, is a, is a smaller type. So usually they're small beads and the nacre is relatively thin. South Sea and Tahitian pearls usually have a larger size, so they use bigger beads. Um, according to our experience, uh, Akoya pearls can range nacre thickness from uh, 0.15 millimeter to about one millimeter. Um, for South Sea pearls, it's a, a lot thicker, usually above one millimeter, up to maybe two, even three millimeter. Tahitian is in between. Around 0.7 millimeter is a normal size for Tahitian pearls. It's also depending on whether the farm want to, the farmers want to um, retrieve larger pearls or smaller pearls, because the larger pearls uh, will also take longer time to grow. Um, freshwater pearls also, there is also freshwater bee cultured pearls, by the way, and the quality of them are become better and better. So uh, their bead and nickel thickness is comparable to South Sea culture the pearls, according to my experience. Okay, great. When it comes to pearls, what is the rarest color of pearl? And then as kind of a follow-up to that, what do you see as the rarest color of a treated pearl? Well, to answer the question, I've never seen I treated the pearl in blue because it's too fake. There's no blue, well, there are bluish pearls. Some uh, Tahitian pearls, especially Tahitian pearls, or well, Pintada margaritifera pearls, more specifically speaking, from Fiji. They look bluish. They have a very pretty, beautiful bluish overtone as well. But a color of blue pearl is really rare, in my opinion. Uh, and the body color entirely blue, it's almost impossible. Okay. Can, can you go into a little bit more detail about how pearls are color treated? Okay, the most common way of color treatment, of course, first of all, I have to say that most of the color treatment are secrets to the people who use the, these treatments. So we do not know exactly uh, the process uh, in many cases. Uh, I know they use a lot of chemicals and uh, dye treatment is probably the most frequently used method uh, to treat pearls. One thing I want to mention is, I forgot to mention actually, good question. Nowadays, golden colored pearls, if they are treated, uh, the treatment is so sophisticated, you are not going to be able to see any color concentration on the surface even if the pearl has blemish or drill hole, it's so even, so it, it looks very, very like a normal uh, natural color golden pearl. So we have to rely on advanced instrumentation for color detection. Of course, there are other, uh, there are other par uh, parts play, a, play an important part, like people maybe heating a pearl a little bit, using different kind of chemicals, uh, but I think dye treatment is the most common way of treatment for pearls. Okay, so when, what, what are the, the, are there any methods that someone can use, say at a retail store or at any other point of purchase where they can identify different types of pearls without advanced instrument, instrumentation? Or do we always recommend that you go to a gemological laboratory to make sure that you get a report to be sure? Okay, yes. Um... Of course, um, sending pearls to a gemological lab is always uh, uh, better. Uh, but if I, uh, if I remember correctly, most of the jewelry stores in the market nowadays, retailers, they are selling cultured pearls. So if you are just saying separating different type of cultured pearls, Tahitian, South Sea, Akoya, Freshwater, uh, they are relatively easy if you Let's say if you take our pearl course, GIA pearl course, uh, it will tell you how to 
uh, what are the key characteristics of these typical type of cultured probe. So uh, you may be able to tell just by looking at the external appearance of the pearls, but separating natural versus cultured pearls, you should always consult with the gemological lab. Great. Is there a different grading system for Aquaya pearls? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, unfortunately, there is no universal grading um, standard in the pearl trade at the moment. Uh, People tend to use different ways of describing pearls quality. Um, I know in the market there's triple A, double A kind of quality. In Japan, there's um, different terms to describe uh, the highest quality of a koya. Um, in GIA, as I mentioned earlier, we use a set of value factors called seven value factors, and we describe them or grade them on each of the value factors. Uh, we use common, uh, straightforward uh, nomenclature. For example, luster, we have excellent, very good, good, fair, and poor, five different grades. And in the market, you probably see someone saying this is a triple A uh, or double A, but they are different. So yes, we have different grading standards and the grading systems in this uh, pro trade right now. Okay, uh, what is the most, or how common is the optical whitening and brightening treatment? Um, I, I'm not sure at the moment. I heard that uh, they were common before, uh, but I believe we've seen this kind of pearls from time to time in the lab uh, continuously. Uh, and they are mostly uh, applied to freshwater cultured pearls, uh, but maybe also a koya pearl. Uh, one thing you can do even without uh, 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 sending them to the lab, uh, well, actually one thing uh, I want to mention is usually if people using optical brightener, they are used together with bleaching. So um, in the trade, people consider them as whole, a single one process, as a routine process. So it's, uh, there's less focus on what exactly it is. But in our opinion, there are two types of different mechanisms. So that's why we raise it up uh, in this uh, study. And is brightening something, is brightening a pearl chemically a permanent procedure? Um, this is something that we have to look into. I heard, well, it's pretty stable uh, in general, but chemical brighteners, optical brighteners, may degrade over time, especially if it was uh, shine under the UV light for, for under the light, but we haven't checked uh, the full extent of how stable it is. Uh, I believe um, uh, it might be relatively stable, but very hard to say at the moment. Okay. Uh, is radiocarbon dating a destructive testing method to pearls? And do pearls need to be a certain size to be able to perform that? It's slightly uh, destructive, not too bad. Uh, we need around five milligram of the pearl, which is uh, not a lot, uh, to a relatively large pearl. It's a very small fraction of powders. Uh, if you have a pearl with a drill hole, that's even better because we can easily uh, take some powder from the drill hole, inside of the drill hole, so it is almost not noticeable. That's great. Uh, which, so which pearl testing techniques are destructive to pearls? For the routine test techniques, they are not destructive. For the unconventional techniques, yes, they are. Like DNA, you have to take a lot of powders as well. And uh, you know, for ICPMS, you might have a little, little, uh, little hole on the surface of the pearl. It's very tiny. You almost cannot see it, but these are for unconventional techniques. If we, we really have to perform it in order to get a final conclusion, then maybe it's worth it. Okay. So when it comes to the advanced testing techniques like radiocarbon dating and DNA barcoding, how cost-effective are those methods? And 
you know, do they kind of justify against the value of the gem that's being tested? Right. Um, well, this depends on the value of the pearls. If it is a historic, historically important piece, uh, uh, something that's from a few hundred years ago owned by the royal family, and you want to prove it, you want to support it, maybe that's justified. For regular pearls, uh, I agree, um, it has extra cost. You need to take powder and it takes a long time, not very long, but at least a few weeks. So uh, it really depending on uh, the type of the pearl you are trying to identify. Okay. How do trace elements impact the spectra of a pearl? Um, I'm not sure what kind of spectra you are talking about, whether it's a, a Raman spectroscopy or UV vis spectroscopy or um, EDXRF. Um, trace elemental concentration at this moment, if you're talking about color, uh, we haven't really had, I mean, I read in the articles, certain trace elemental uh, elements uh, may contribute to the uh, color of the pearls in addition to the organic materials, uh, the, con uh, the, the pigmentation found in pearls. Uh, but we haven't really seen much impact of trace elemental concentration on spectra, if you are talking about Raman, uh, UV vis, this kind of thing. Okay, uh, can you explain what a worked pearl is and what and what you, what that term means? Worked pearl uh, in our report, if you see a word worked pearl, it means there's something uh, really obvious being done on the surface of the pearl. Uh, usually, it's a, it's maybe it's smoothing one area or changing or shaping the pearl into a different shape, changing the nacre, uh, heavily cut, uh, he heavily kind of smooth out a surface, cut, sewn base, all these kind of things, we will uh, mention it on our report as worked. If it's just polishing or even heavily polishing, we are not going to say worked on the report. Okay, great. Um, I've seen a few questions coming through. We're just about to wrap up, but I have seen a few questions coming through about how GI tests um, mounted pearls, and we do, right? We test mounted pearls in our lab. Yes, we can test most of the mounted pearls in the lab, as long as there is a part of the pearl can be not blocked by the metal, and we can uh, look at the, the internal structure under the x-ray. So majority of the pearls, on mounted pearls, can be tested. You can always send them to us, we will try to test them. If, uh, if we cannot, we will tell you to unmount the pearl. Great. Um, I'm also seeing some questions about our educational offerings. So uh, do we learn about pearls in the graduate gemology course, or is there a different course for pearls? There is a different course for pearls, but maybe you can speak a little bit about the, what you learn about pearls in a GG program. Yeah, there is a separate pearl course, which is not part of the GG diploma, actually but it tells you a lot about uh, pearl, the history of the pearls, the history of the culture of the pearls, and different type of pearls as well. So you will learn a lot uh, from this course. It's an online course, plus a one day, I believe it's a grading kind of uh, a lab course. Uh, if you are taking GG, I think pearls are mentioned in uh, color stone identity, gem identification kind of uh, course. It's part of the chapter actually, but Pearl has its own course, uh, independent course. If you are interested, you should definitely check it out. Yeah, and that you can do through distance education as well. So, right. um, so that's available for you to do as soon as, as, soon as Monday. Um, and then we're just about to wrap up. I just wanted to mention there were a few people asking more about the seven value factors. So I think that might be something we wanna maybe do a separate session on. But for now, especially if you're a retailer and you're working um, you know, in your retail store and trying to communicate what these seven value factors are to your customers, we have a Pearl brochure that explains those at our store. So at store.gia.edu, you can find those, um, those uh, retailer support materials available for you to help you explain at the counter. Um, and with that, I think we're just about at the top of the hour. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we will be back again next week with Evan Smith and he'll tell us all about diamond exploration and mining. And thanks again to Chun Wee. 
Uh, and if you have any other questions for GIA, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And that's it for today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.